Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming uh, to another one of uh, Pioneer's live streams. Um, if this is your first time uh, watching any one of these streams, um, welcome. Uh, the goal is uh, really twofold. Um, one is to get to give you a chance to meet some of our pioneers, the companies that they're working on, uh, and get give you a chance to kind of get a sense of what some of the best pioneers are working on. The second is really to just give folks a broader understanding of what Pioneer is shooting for and what we're trying to do. Um, there's probably a, a fairly long preamble one could give uh, just about what Pioneer does. I just recommend instead of me giving you that, you go to the website and check it out, pioneer.app. Um, the goal is to really build some type, effectively an equivalent of what, you know, um, the great cities, the great uh, campuses, the great colleges do, but on the internet. And so at the end of the day, a lot of what Silicon Valley provides is a sense of camaraderie with other people starting startups, uh, connections to investors, that type of thing. And um, Pioneer is basically that built in software on the web. Um, it's pretty nifty. You should check it out. Um, the website will do a better job than me, hopefully, at explaining it. Um, so as I mentioned today, we're going to go through um, uh, nine uh, of our finest Pioneer companies. These are people that have gone through our tournament, scored really well, become a Pioneer, and have been... Um, going through this um, Pioneer Camp process culminating in a presentation today uh, to some great hosts and viewed by, uh, you know, many of you, um, other founders, and more importantly, other investors. We have nine companies, as I mentioned, presenting today. Uh, we have three amazing hosts, uh, and then one final um, uh, really fun piece of content that you'll want to stay tuned for, I think. The first is uh, David Ulovich, uh, uh, who works at Andrews and Horowitz. Second is going to be Natalie Sandman, who works at Spark Capital. And then the third is going to be Vinod Kosla um, from Kosla Ventures. So three of, you know, you know, probably the best um, uh, investors from certainly the best firms in Silicon Valley, the world, will be listening to some of our pitches of pioneers. They're going to have two minutes to present, and then we'll do some quick Q&A after. Finally, we're going to close um, with Emmett uh, uh, Shear, the founder of Twitch, uh, who will be pitching uh, Twitch uh, as if this was, you know, 2011 or 2012. So he's actually going to go through some of the old Twitch deck materials with us. And I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch and we'll probably remind people that, you know, billion dollar acquisitions start really small. Uh, I would like to bring up our first host, uh, David, uh, who's a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. And thank you so much for being with us today. We have three awesome pioneers um, that are gonna be presenting to you. And first up is gonna be Stan uh, from Poland, who's gonna be presenting Arapa. And the concept behind Arapa, just to give you a sense as Stan comes up on stage is, is basically a kind of Fiverr for, for sales reps. The idea is to make it significantly easier to do sales style introductions by use of his platform. And I'm gonna let Stan take it from here. Hello everyone, I'm Stan, co-founder of Arapa, which is a paper intro marketplace where you get warm introductions to your dream prospects. So meet Kim, Kim is a customer of ours and Kim, is the sales manager at a company called Loop Returns, and Kim is on the lookout to close more deals with e-commerce companies. The old way of doing so would be to buy a software, then buy data, and then even potentially hire someone to manage all of it. The new way is simply using Corapa. On our marketplace, she goes and she fills out a quick form where she specifies who she would like to meet with, how much she is paying for the introduction, and other details about her customers. On our marketplace, Kim meets Jan, and Jan is a BDR at a company called Firework. And Jan has a large network of e-commerce companies. So Jan goes to Orapa, fills out a quick form where we, where, we can, where we can find him the best opportunities that match his network. He sees Kim's opportunity and sends her an introduction offer. Kim accepts that opportunity and finishes the payment, sends money to Jan for the introduction. The end result is that Kim just got a new customer and Jan made $200 from his network with just a few clicks. The business model is that we charge $99 a month subscription from people like Kim and we charge a 10% marketplace fee from people like Jan. We have about 65 customers. They get on average 30 new leads every month and we are now at 6K MRR. We 5X our grow in the last six months. Our go-to-market is outbound and referrals. Our beachhead market is e-commerce industry, which presents us with $5 billion opportunity. We are on track to hit $1 million in 2021. And by adding free tools and content, we will hit $10 million in 2023, with one third being from subscription revenue and 70% being from marketplace revenue. I am an ex-pro Olympic athlete. I used to work at Cornerstone, and my co-founder, Dominik, used to work at Samsung. We met at Kozminski University in Poland, and we are a part of Launch Accelerator right now, led by Jason Kalakanis. 
Thank you. I'm Stan, co-founder of Orapa, which is a paper intro marketplace. That was awesome, uh, Stan. That's a great overview, great pitch. And uh, you know, I think it's a really interesting opportunity because like you sort of highlighted, salespeople really want to have meetings. They don't want to just be sending random emails and spams and dialing for dollars all the time. I guess one of my questions is, when the, when the middleman in the, in the relationship makes the introduction, does the person at the company that, the, that Kim wants to meet with, do they get paid? Or are they just learning about a product they might be interested in? So no, the, the, the middleman, the rain maker or the um, intro maker, as we call them, they get paid for making the introduction. Um, it can be, of course, a different vehicle, um, just for example, a, a commission for a sale, but the usual is just a, for the introduction, which usually was a, is a phone call, a meeting on the calendar, or just an e- email introduction. Great. And then how do you think about it? Do you think long term, because there's lots of people that have great networks and great relationships, but a lot of those relationships can be overlapping. How do you think about what happens over time as you get really big and multiple people can make the same introduction? Do you see that becoming like a, a bidding war or sort of the marketplace pricing coming into effect? If 20 people all know the head of, um, you know, the app store at Apple or something like that, or some, some really valuable relationship, but there's a lot of people that can make that connection. How do you think that kind of works out over time? Um, so I think that would be a very valuable for customers, uh, companies, because they can pick uh, the best introduction to, which is, for example, the, the best relationship with the prospect or uh, just the best insights on the prospect that the uh, intro maker can, can provide. I guess along those same lines, one of the one of the other questions I have is, what do you think is more valuable? I guess the the sort of the score rating of the middle of the rainmaker, as you call the person. Like, are they somebody who's able to actually make those introductions, or is it the value of their network? You know, they know somebody at at Apple or Amazon or at all the major e-commerce sites. Like, how, how do you think about the the relative as you build out this service and you build out the network and the marketplace? What's more important to go find people that have those relationships or is it the rainmakers and keeping them really happy and really motivating them to, to encourage people to come on and, and use the platform? How do you, how do you see the different stakeholders and in, in their relative importances? So of course, having a high quality introductions will decrease value to, to customers and that's what we're all about. Um, however, I think we need to find the right balance between getting those uh, valuable um, relationships and also getting the scale of maybe not so valuable, but still life-changing introductions that can add a couple of deals to the pli- pipeline in a span of a year. Awesome. And I trust Daniel is going to interrupt me when I'm, when I'm out of time. But I have one more question, which is that as you think about sort of the technology, right now you've sort of built this workflow kind of marketplace to broker these introductions and connections. But do you see there being a sort of a data and technology play over time where you're going to leverage, I don't know, their social network connections or, or other kinds of relationships to try to figure out what the actual map of the, of the network looks like, you know, looking at their email or things like that? Yes, this is on the roadmap. We hope to release a couple of more tools to help map those relationships and have, help actually uh, value your network. You know, how they say your net worth is your network. We hope to actually put the number. Yeah, awesome. Look, I like the combination of the subscription-based sort of subscription with the, uh, the total usage fees and the take rate. I think it's really cool. So thanks for sharing it with me. Thank you. Great presentation. Well done. David, next up, we have David in Kenya, and he's going to be presenting Honeycoin. Uh, And Honeycoin is a kind of um, African uh, variant of the Cash App, uh, of which um, there are a bunch, and he's going to walk us through kind of why they're, you know, exciting, unique, and different. David, take it away. Uh, So, hi. Yeah, I'm David Nando. I'm the founder of Honeycoin. Uh, And a fun way to describe essentially what we do is if Cash App and and Ngombrud had a baby and that baby was born in Africa. And as I go through this quick presentation, like my hope is you'll be able to see why that description is a really great fit for us. So let's talk about the problem. So P2P remittance in Africa is still extremely fragmented. You have like a lot of these great platforms uh, trying to build X for Africa, but they're doing really well in a particular space or country and are scaling too slow to actually serve like a lot of the underserved communities that are still existing. And monetization wise uh, for, for African creators, existing platforms like Gumroad, Buy Me A Coffee, 
Patreon are just not built for and are neither optimizing for African creators. So you can see this in the payment methods available for consumers. You can see this in the currencies that these platforms charge in and even in the withdrawal methods available. So most of them only support US bank accounts or PayPal, which is just, uh, it, it's definitely not able to accommodate African creators as a whole. So at Honeycoin, we have and are increasing both the accessibility and affordability of cross-border payments. So we do this through key partnerships, country-level integrations, as well as leveraging blockchain and crypto to create a truly decentralized and global monetization network. So as you can see through the quick demos that are playing on the screen at this time, we're also particularly focused on bridging the gap between fiat and crypto, but doing so in a way that allows our users to interact with both in, and it doesn't essentially feel friction. It doesn't have any friction or make them feel like they're interacting with two different entities. So since our launch in October, we've experienced very clear and early signs of product market fit. And this year, our North Star is essentially to just continue providing value to users and validating our product as well as scaling it to serve more and more users. So we're growing um, pretty excitingly at, at about five to 10 users a day. And most of this um, traction has, essentially, has actually been organic. So our target market is essentially Gen Z and millennials, as well as creators. So if you think about writers, photographers, artists, and everyone really in the fashion economy space, we are essentially building for and optimizing the platform for them. And there are a bunch of ways that we're particularly different, as you can see on the screen. So one big differentiator that will also be seen in our business model is we actually charge 0% in transaction fees. And, like, and unlike most platforms, we're essentially also optimizing for blockchain monetization, which we feel is only we're essentially just at 1% of what it's about to become. And we're pretty excited, excited about that. Yeah, so as I mentioned briefly, in terms of our business model, we, we're optimizing ourselves to be the most affordable plat plat platform in the market. And that's why we actually charge 0% on uh, transaction fees and only make our money by charging 4.5 to 7.6% on withdrawal fees, as well as 1% for all uh, cryptocurrency transfers. So we're currently in these countries, but technically we can actually support more countries, but we'll be looking to scale into these additional countries by Q2 and Q3 of this year. At this time, I'm the only one on the team. So I built out the platform between April and September last year and launched it on October. And at the rate that we're growing and just you know the traction that we're seeing, I definitely know that it will be time to expand the team this year. And I'm definitely looking to make some key hires in order to help us continue to scale the product and manage it you know, just based on the traction and, and initial pool that we've received. So we've currently closed our pre-seed round, um, but if, there any, if there's anyone who's watching this at this time and are interested in connecting, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. All right, well, that was a great pitch, David. And uh, you know, I'm not an expert, I would say, in the, influence, the influencer and passion economy, um, but I do try <laughs> to sit in on as many, as many of those pitches as I can. And I yeah. do think the ability to enable frictionless payments, micropayments, Payments where the transaction fee isn't an inhibitor to people actually making a small payment is really exciting. I guess yeah. my first question is, you know, is, is crypto, do you think, is that a hook to get people onto Honeycoin? Or is that because crypto enables you to do the transactionless, or sorry, the transaction fee free sort of payments? Explain to me why the crypto part is so important to, to Honeycoin and what you're doing. That's a great question. That's a really good question. So, so why we're really excited about crypto is because we've essentially built an off-chain ledger as well that allows for fee-less transactions. So if you look at the transaction cost, even on Ethereum at this time, it's about $16. So if we talk about just transacting on the blockchain layer, actually, it's not feasible long-term because you've already eliminated a bunch of consumers. And that being said, fiat-wise, the problem with fiat, like if you think about KES, NGN, uh, UGX, and all of these local currencies, scaling into all of these particular markets is extremely slow. And why we're excited about crypto is because everyone, just like you need an email address to send an email to someone, with crypto, we essentially open up the whole continent without the friction of all the borders and regulation around fiat currencies. But I mean, that being said, crypto is also you know, starting to be regulated. So that's also what keeps us up at night. But yeah, it's more exciting in terms of just the scalability of crypto, um, in terms of just the friction, frictionless aspect of it. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. You talked about right now how five to 10 users a day are coming onto the platform. Are those people that, you know, you think of as being sort of influencers and people that are going to be recipients of money or people that are sending money to the people they already follow? And then 
you know, the second part of that question is how are you going to go and get more people that are sort of the influencers onto the platform? Because presumably if you get enough of them, they'll bring their audience to <laughs> Honeycoin, right? That's a great question and, and a great observation as well. So in the, fi the five to 10 user metric is essentially users who are leveraging us for P2P transfers. So one of the largest trends we've seen is university students love using us essentially to receive money from home, like from their parents or to transact between each other. But in terms of our audience size, the, one of the largest creators we have has an audience size of about 5,000 and they're a photographer. And we expect, so if talking about that particular side, we're actually more excited about that because exactly what you said, like like, um, we're focused on bringing like about even this year, 10 creators with really large audiences who love our platform because those 10 creators can essentially bring on like, you know, I mean, it's an unlimited number of people, but yeah, we're, we're, pre we're pretty excited about that aspect of just the monetization and then just focused on bringing on those types of, of creators. Awesome. And then go just going back to the sort of the more cash app side of it, the, that because um, I, I forgot about the, uh, I was thinking about the university students exchanging money. How often do you think, like, is the cross-currency ability to, to exchange money a really big problem that needs to be solved? Or is that just a way for you to expand into multiple markets quickly? Or do people really have the cross-currency sort of like, you know, exchanging money issue in real life? Oh, yeah. That, no, that's a, that's a great question. So it, it's still a huge problem. If you think about like right now, why it's so fragmented is, you know, banks essentially rely on SWIFT and SWIFT was not actually built for the African continent. And so there's still like really large fees. So when you're sending money between borders, even um, from Kenya and Uganda, which share borders, you end up losing up to 20 percent and have to convert the money to USD to send to that particular country. But what we see is actually in order to accelerate just the adoption for this and continue to serve on the serve markets quicker, we need to be making like these key partnerships more and more with players who are already on the ground to essentially build a pipeline across the continent to you know, uh, now allow users to transact in their own currencies, their local currencies, whilst bringing the costs to zero, hopefully, and then own, allowing them to essentially save up to like the most amount of money when they are receiving the, the uh, currency that they are receiving. That, that makes a lot of sense. Well, look, I'm excited for Honeycoin. Thanks so much. No, thanks so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> Excellent energy on, on both of your accounts. Well done, David. Uh, and next up is our Zach and Dylan. Uh, they're in Florida and they're going to be presenting Parked. And Parked is, it's kind of an interesting pitch. It, uh, it's basically Airbnb for parking. Um, so in Florida, uh, as you may know, par parking is relatively scarce. And so they're letting people basically auction. Uh, their own space off for parking. So kind of an interesting business, an interesting pitch. And I'm going to let um, Dylan and Zach take it from here. Hey, everybody. My name is Dylan Faith, co-founder of Parked. I'm here today with my co-founder, uh, Zach, and we are building the Airbnb of parking. Our product on the driver's side allows our users to search a destination, compare available listings, and book their ideal space within seconds. On the host side, our users can easily list their space, adjust their space details on the fly and sit back and earn extra income. Our business model is simple. The driver books the space, we keep a 20% fee, and then we pay out the rest to the host. Now our adoption strategy is city acquisition where we try to conquer our city one by one. And currently right now we're focused on Miami and that's our main focus right now. And the, the problem in Miami is that parking is extremely expensive, super inconvenient and almost impossible to find. And here we show you a screenshot of a search and a parking search in Miami set to a one hour duration on parked and our two biggest competitors. As you can see, we have way more available spots. And this is due to the larger supply of privately owned parking spaces as opposed to commercial lots or garages. And you can also see that our, our price is way cheaper and that's due to our competitive marketplace model. So our host can set their own price and it creates a competitive market. Now here's just a timeline of our company. We officially launched our iOS app in uh, March of 2020, which was at the start of the coronavirus. And while this hurt us, we actually used it to our advantage to focus on host acquisition during this time so that we would have the supply to meet the demand once uh, things got back to normal. And uh, later in that year, we ended up getting our first booking in October of 2020. And now that we move into 2021, we're focused on the development of our web application. And we also recently received our 10th booking. In Miami, currently we have 89 total listings and 577 total listings across the country. And to date we've received 10 bookings with average booking costs of $59 and 11 cents. 
We're currently seeking our pre-seed uh, investment of $150,000, and these funds will be made to will be used to make key hires and also expedite our growth. Thank you for watching. Here's our contact information if you're interested. Awesome. All right. Well, look, park, parking is a problem whether uh, we have real cars or or self-driving cars. But let me ask you, like you know, assuming that the world of self-driving cars happens, does park turn into an API? Is that something you think about? How does that change the dynamics of how parked works? Um, I'm just curious how, how the future looks for you. Yeah, so that that, that we assume is uh, at least a couple of years down the road and we have done some thinking about that. And one, one really interesting idea that we had was, so something like Uber or Lyft would end up becoming extremely big because people, they just have self-driving cars everywhere. You won't really need to have your own car if they can have a car to you within seconds or minutes. So at that point, those that, that self-driving fleet's still gonna need to park somewhere. And so one idea we had is that we could partner with someone like Lyft or Uber and they would have, we would have our host uh, have them park their spot at our host's house so that no matter where you are, there's a, there's a self-driving car within seconds of you, you know? So we'll have them embedded in residential areas and everything like that. So that anytime anyone needs an Uber, it's there in seconds. So that's one idea we had when awesome. it self-driving. Yeah, for sure. After, after the cars drop you off, they need to park somewhere. Right. right. Talk to me a little bit about how you think about going after individual hosts that have like an empty spot in front of their house or something like that versus parking operators and people or even people that own parking lots. Because I think the operator, the people that own the lots are not always the same people that are the operators. Right. So talk to me about where that fits into sort of the business and whether you want to avoid them or if they're, they're part of the plan. Yeah, so they actually are part of the plan currently. We haven't distinguish between the two when it comes to advertisements we've just been advertising to host and we have had success getting both residential like just privately owned spots as well as some people that are larger operators of lots and garages in downtown miami have also put their uh garage on the platform in order to fill up some of those vacancies so we have been able to see both use the use the same platform in the same way and get different outcomes so like you like a single spot is treated as a single spot, but when you post a garage, each spot is also treated separately so that they could fill those vacancies quite easily. Got it. And then, so that, this will bring me to maybe maybe my last question or second last question, which is, you know, what technology, if someone's parking in a commercial garage where there's a gate and there's like, you have to be able to let into the garage without paying the garage, or maybe someone with a host probably has like a garage door or something, maybe it needs to be open. How do you, how are you going to planning to, to tackle all the sort of technology issues and things that could, could be inhibitors to just, you know, friction of parking. Right. Well, they currently have that type of technology that I, I think it t taps into the Bluetooth connectivity of the different garages and gates, and as well as through, right through an app. The only thing that's stopping us from using that would be money. It's uh, it's pretty expensive and to build a proprietary solution would probably even be more expensive as it's pretty complex, but there is that technology available and we can implement it once we have the proper resources to do so. Got it. Understood. And then I guess my last question, how do you think about acquiring users? Like how do people find out about parked? The parkers, how do the, the car parkers find out about parked? Right. So that's where like with the, with the current pandemic and everything is kind of putting a dampering on getting actual people to park because parking is not such a huge issue. Like uh, the Google trends for parking searches is down 30% from the start of coronavirus, but it's now starting to trend back up. So our, our next plan is to uh, just implement um. Google ads and things along those lines. And the reason why we're focusing on our web app development is because currently with just the iOS app, when we need to get someone to park or when we're advertising to them, they would see the Google ad and then there would be another barrier where they need to download the app, sign up and all that. So the way we're setting up the web app is if they search parking in Miami, they click our ad, Miami will already be searched and all those spots will be there. So it would be a real easy onboarding process and there won't be many barriers for them. So we think that's really gonna increase our bookings as well. Awesome. All right. Well, that's exciting. And uh, I hope to make it to Miami soon. I feel like all the smart people have already gone there. So I got to, I got to follow suit. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Great work guys. David, thank you so much. Great, great questions. We're going to let you Thanks for uh, having me. <laughs> We're going to go back to the mountains now. Um, all right, David, good to see you. Next up we have Natalie. Hey, Natalie. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining us today. We have three great pioneers uh, that are going to be presenting their companies to you um, uh, from um, around the world, not just the United States. That's going to be pretty exciting. Um, first off, we have uh, Eric. 
uh, from California, and he's going to be presenting Boost, uh, which is a kind of um, Twilio for machine learning, uh, a platform to kind of make it easier uh, to get started with machine learning projects and give everyone the same infrastructure, say, folks internally at OpenAI or Google have. Um, so Eric, take it away. My name is Eric. I am the founder of Boost. Boost is Twilio for machine learning. Basically, training a machine learning model is surprisingly easy. There's tutorials out there but productionizing said model is notably difficult. And it's because the ML ecosystem lacks a established dev friendly platform. So in payments, PayPal made way for Stripe, in production app hosting, AWS made way for Heroku. And we have SageMaker as the most robust uh, system for productionizing an ML model, but there really lacks a dev friendly solution. So the challenge is to becoming an AI company is that you need an extremely niche skill set in order to build your stack and home grow your serving solution. There's really no best practices. Most companies I talk to do it differently. Uh, so they're hiring two to 10 full-time engineers. They're fighting an uphill battle with poor unit econ. And then lastly, in the world of GPD-3, where the models are physically larger than the servers they could run on, it's just a total step change when it comes to how difficult it is to run these models. So basically only the tech giants can do it. Boost is so rather than going through the standard six month process of meeting with ops, talking with the machine learning team, getting those meetings set up, prototyping servers about four or five different times, uh, ultimately to just throw money into GPUs on a horizontal scaling and say, okay, it's out, this is good, we'll fix it later. Boost is simply a copy paste. Traction so far includes three live APIs. I have 15 weekly active users. So that's derivative apps in production using Boost. I've handled 32,000 API calls over the last few months. And currently I'm running at one model inference per second. So that's 120 inferences just in this two minute pitch. Recently started monetizing at 1.1 MRR, though it is usage based. So projections look like they'll hit above 3K MRR at the end of the month. Calls per week are growing. Uh, since November, I've gone from zero to 11,000 calls in a week. I believe that the future software of 2020 is going to be very ML forward, very defined by machine learning models. So the next Google can be powered by a boost. I'm raising a million dollars to make this happen. This gives me 18 months of runway, allows me to expand the team to five and hit 1 million ARR. My contact info is right there. Happy to take questions. Awesome. Um, well, first off, congrats on the progress. Um, I think I'd love to hear more about just how you think about, like talking a little bit more about your customers and how they're using mm -hmm. the product today. And if you know more about kind of what they're using the current models. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the emerging use case I've seen, I guess for perspective, I have three APIs up. One is GPT-2 following the GPT-3 wave. Uh, second is a custom trained GPT-2 model for blog generation, long form content. And thirdly is a clip API, which is image classification. And that blog model is really the hot topic right now. I'm finding a niche where people want very specifically tailored content. So they need a retrained model. So they come to boost despite having open AI as a potential option. Um, on the user front, I've had a surprising amount of ML savvy people. In fact, the, my main customer is led by an open AI researcher so they're, they're, they're not new to this domain. It's just, they don't want to hand roll the infrastructure themselves. Uh -huh. And how do you think about um, almost, you mentioned that you have three models today. How do you think about expanding that suite? Um, and is it mainly going to be almost like pre-trained out of the box models or would you provide yeah. that as well? So contrary to the open AI angle, I don't really believe in the whole one model that uh, rules them all sort of approach. So currently I do have pre-trained models up for free. I'm monetizing custom trained models. And in the future, I'd actually like to take somewhat of a, a, I'll call it an affiliate marketing play where I go to a publisher, an ML researcher who has a GitHub repo and I have them embed a deploy on boost button on their site, do a revenue share with them. So that allows me to essentially crowdsource the best and most recent models without additional effort on my end. So I would like to ultimately go through that eventually implement a training pipeline to help people fine tune these models. But for now, it's just pure serving existing models. Uh -huh. Very cool. And then are there any, I guess, are there any customers that have, the way they're using your APIs, it's surprised you? 
Off of the top of my head, I'll honestly say no on that one. Um, the, the one story I can think about um, was a user I had spent an entire month building out a, a very extensive, like fine tuning feature on top of the model and they ended up not using it. So um, basically there's, there's been a lot of trial and error. And when it comes down to it, the core, the core thing that I'm providing is speed to aha, just the simple, um, you know, copy paste the code and you're up and running. Yep. Very cool. And then uh, last question, how do you think about kind of with the raise, thinking about expanding the business and like really acquiring net new customers and mm -hmm. thoughts on strategies there? Yeah, so really it's, it's, it's come down to dev time. I have a backlist of five different companies who are wanting to get on top of Boost. Um, so most of the raise is going towards hiring um, and also just increasing the robustness of the product from both a availability and dependability sense, as well as the unit economic side. So that's going to be the main focus for the next year and a half. Cool. Very cool. Congrats on the progress. And I'll Thank definitely you. share with companies in our, in our world to start using you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If they, if they take longer than five minutes to get it up and running, I'll buy them a coffee. Yeah. Well, that, that's a commitment right there. Um, it's better than uh, your money back. Uh, you get, coffee out of it. Uh, Eric, thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Brian Waterstone from uh, Indiana, and he's going to be presenting OwlMail, which is a kind of privacy.com, which lets us generate uh, instant kind of credit cards to keep our identity private, uh, but for email. Uh, so kind of instant relay email on demand, similar to how Apple um, uh, kind of lets you do it when, when you use uh, their authentication scheme. Um, Brian, um, from the speakeasy that you seem to be projecting in, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so everybody listening has probably shared their personal email address with countless products and services online. And unfortunately, this freely hands out both uh, our unique digital identity and a direct path to our inbox, which ultimately invades our privacy, weakens our security, and kind of nags at our attention. So I'm Brian, and I'm building Alamail to solve this problem. And to, to be more clear, Alamail is the service layer that will power a generation of privacy-focused products that handle identity and communication online. So currently companies that want the privacy and security benefit of a service like Alamail end up building something in-house. For example, Craigslist runs an email relay to provide anonymous communication between buyers and sellers. The problem is that building and maintaining a service like this is expensive. The solution is to expose an API and a simple dashboard that makes it both cost effective uh, for companies of any size or any technical capability to add address issuing or an email relay into their product. So there's a really wide range of use cases for a service like Alamail, and I just want to highlight two examples. Uh, password managers like 1Password could issue email password credential pairs and payment platforms like Fast could issue merchant locked email addresses to improve the privacy and security of their users during the checkout process. So just a little bit about me. I previously worked as a software engineer at AWS. And after, the, after that, I went on to start two companies before Alamail. At those companies, I wore a variety of hats, including sales, brand design, fundraising, product development, business strategy, and software engineering. So I started working on Alamail about six months ago and I've been focused on two things. First, I built the underlying service. And second, I built a minimal consumer facing web app on top. And by doing this, I was able to become my own first customer. This helped me create a clear roadmap for the service going forward. And it generated enough traffic to help me harden the services performance and reliability. It's now at a point where I feel confident exposing it as a public facing API and onboarding early customers. And I've already had the chance to talk with a product owner who has an email relay on their roadmap and expressed interest in using Alamail instead of building something in-house. So I'm, raise, I'm currently raising $450,000 to expand the team, productize the API, get our first customers online and operationalize sales. So if you're excited about this space, I'd love to connect. Very cool, I love the, I mean, I love the analogy of privacy.com for email. Um, one question I have is almost thinking through if a company were to implement OWL, what does the experience in terms of their customers look like in terms of these almost like virtual email, potentially passcode pairs? Yep. So if it's in kind of the password manager use case, 
um, in that case, the, the email would just be saved in your password manager, similar to how you save your personal email today. Um, and at the, in your inbox, uh, as the user, you just receive a normal email that you can reply to and interact with like you normally would. Um, so the goal with my goal with Alamail is to have kind of this service layer be as uh, invisible as possible to the end user. Very cool. And then can you talk about some of the early prospective customers that you're talking to and what like what they're looking to implement in terms of the use case? Yep. So the one customer that I talked to was a, a hiring marketplace similar to TripleByte. Um, but they're a newer uh, company. Um, and so Triple, Triple Byte actually operates an in-house email relay similar to what Owlmail will be exposing as a service. And so their use case is almost identical. They just wanna make it easy um, for the candidates and the companies to be able to communicate with each other kind of at, on the early end of that process without having to exchange their personal email. And I guess, like, what um, what use case are you more ex most excited about in terms of the either the market potential or just the customers? Yep. So I'm kind of most excited that email, because the email address is a globally unique identity and the pathway to our inbox, email sits at the intersection of identity and communication. And so I think by having Alamail as a service in that spot, there are a lot of really cool uh, privacy and security products that Owlmail can kind of build on top. And so that, I think that, that's a really exciting big picture to me. Uh -huh. Very cool. Um, and how do you think about kind of acquiring your first developers and really thinking about expanding Mindshare with developers? Yep, so at, at this point, um, I'll, I'll start with the, the company that I've talked with and then going forward, I'll just, I, I showed that slide that kind of had like, here are the different use cases. And so I'm just gonna go through those use cases, find as many companies I can, start reaching out um, and see if I can start onboarding uh, other developers. It, yeah, it seems, like a, it seems like an interesting time in the market, just with the shift of people want, especially for authentication, people want low friction, um, but they also want the security. And so I feel like the product that you're building could give them both in a way in terms of that security around anonymous email, essentially, but still being able to rely on kind of a unique identifier. Yep, I think that um, software as a whole, you know, software eating the world is kind of like this big wave and underneath it are sort of these smaller waves. And I, and I certainly think that kind of a reversion back to, to privacy is the norm, is sort of a wave that we're just starting to pick up on. And so I hope that our mail can be kind of critical infrastructure as part of that process. And would you, I guess, would you expand beyond email as a unique identifier and expand to any other channels? Yep, I think there are a lot of interesting, uh, like on the communication side, there's a lot of kind of end-to-end -end encrypted uh, projects popping up, um, you know, so potentially our mail could actually run on sort of like a matrix relay or something like that. And so I think right now, email is certainly the thing everybody uses um, in this case, but going forward, I don't think email has to, is, is, is necessarily what our mail runs on. Very cool. And then can you talk a little bit about um, just how you're thinking about building the team and the team today? Yep. So right now the team is just uh, myself. I'm a solo founder um, and I have currently somebody I previously worked with at AWS who's a software engineer. Um, he's been kind of low touch interacting with me on this project just because he thought it was really interesting. Um, and as soon as I have the capital to hire him, I would hire him. He's, he's basically ready to go. Awesome. That was excellent. Thank you both uh, very much. Um, did an excellent job, Brian. Um, next up, last and certainly not least, Natalie, uh, I'd love to uh, introduce you to Rahul. Uh, Rahul is uh, from India and he's going to be presenting ModFi. Um, ModFi is Figma for video. Um, and Rahul's take is interesting. It's that if you kind of really want to do video editing, you have to do it client side, but you still want to do it in the browser. Uh, and so it's a confluence of both. And I'll let Rahul explain it. Take it away. Uh, I'm Rahul and I'm building ModFi video. It's a new way to process videos right within your browser. So like what Daniel was saying, like my hypothesis is video processing is very expensive. We have these amazing online image tools, but we have really bad online video tools. And that's because there's a huge network and compute cost associated with processing video. So the real only real solution to this is processing videos client side. This makes a cheaper and faster experience for everybody. Essentially, we're trying to build a Figma for video in the sense that 
we don't have this amazing tool like Figma for video simply because the server side cost is so expensive. It's not possible to do and you have to do it client side. So we currently have a very minimal technology preview of the product, what's already capable, which is like a self-serve converter, compressor, trimmer that we have some users using. So here's just a quick demo of it. You add your files, you choose your settings, no need to download anything, no complex setup, uh, no dealing with any of these deep, complicated things about video processing. It just works. I have sped up the video processing just a little bit because uh, we don't have a lot of time and video processing does take a minute. But yeah, it already shows you what's possible with this technology and how easy it is to use already. But we want to build a lot more than this. We want to build a full video editor on top of this platform that we already built. And that's something that's on our product roadmap to build out this year. So also, a lot of companies have reached out to us and asked us to integrate this technology into their own video-based products. So we're building an API, um, which we're planning to launch in the next month for other companies to integrate this technology. We have a wait list of about, um, I think, 30 companies waiting on us to um, launch this product. On our consumer side, we have had a little bit of traction. We have processed about uh, 2,000 videos and about 80 gigabytes so far in the last three months. Um, we don't have too many users, but we do have a small percent of our user base that really likes our product. But 10% of our users have processed about 45% of the videos on the platform. Uh, currently, we're looking for more early users and looking for, pre uh, looking for investors for a pre-seed round of about $100,000 to expand the team and grow fast. I'm Rahul, I'm the founder of Modify, and ha uh, thank you, happy to take any questions. Very cool, Rahul. I was using the product earlier today and it's super impressive and super flushed out. Um, one question I have for you is, can you talk a little bit more about the underlying tech and it's like, are you relying on WebAssembly or kind of what makes this possible today? Yeah, so that's actually, uh, we, we are relying on WebAssembly and there's actually something interesting here that like, because we are on this WebAssembly curve where a lot of modern technology is slowly going to build on this, we get a huge benefit from not having to hire the engineers to better WebAssembly. They're being paid by Google, uh, Mozilla, all these big companies. And we get the performance boost every time they make the software better. So we can ride that curve of WebAssembly as it keeps getting better. So that's a huge benefit for us in the sense that like our product just gets better day on day, year on year, without us having to do any of that engineering work in that sense, which is uh, very useful. So it, yeah. it is very much based on WebAssembly. Yeah. Very cool. And then how do you how do you think about almost the prosumer direct to consumer adoption? versus even enterprise or kind of more of a team using the product versus the API product? So uh, we are experimenting with all these things to see like which way is the best way to move forward. But like for us, like generally video editors, like the way they've been like the pro, like the real pro audience, they are very used and very set in their ways, right? They've been using their products for five, 10 years. So that's not the first market we want to target. We want to target uh, like this developer kind of audience, this more consumer audience, kind of people who are joining YouTube first, creating videos first, because they have to go and like pay for these expensive softwares and then go learn how to use them. And that's a much easier market to break into. And then you can start moving up into the prosumer market because those, um, like those uh, workflows, they, they're not really willing to change their workflows. In terms of teams using it, I think that's one of the big advantages of bringing like a full video editor to the web is once you have uh, the underlying technology to process videos, and then you have a really good web editor, you can obviously add really good collaboration and mm -hmm. you can have this amazing collaborative experience that is not possible anywhere else. Like when uh, me and my friends are trying to make films, uh, what we do is we pick up our laptop, go to each other's house, sit together and do it because there's no other way to do it, right? Um, yeah, so like that's definitely one of the things we think a lot about. And then you have this, uh, nice way to um, monetize the product using uh, teams and you can charge per user on the team. Uh -huh. Very cool. No, and I definitely agree with that. I think Adobe Creative Suite, they leave a lot to be desired, especially for a kind of lower end user. Are there any, like with the current kind of consumer usage, are there any kind of killer features that people really come to the product for, whether it's compression or shortening or another feature? So I think like the main reason a lot of consumers come to the product and what we've heard is it's really simple to use. So that's the main overall feature, but the, in the specific feature, it's definitely trimming right now because you have no time to upload your video because it's all done uh, on the, on your browser. And it happens almost instantaneously. It's one of our fastest features. So a lot of people really um, love that feature. That's, that's probably our most used feature. Right now. Very cool. 
And then how do you think about continuing to acquire users? And are there any kind of strategies you're excited about? Um, so what we uh, are thinking about acquiring users, we target like smaller communities and like Reddit. That's where we've had our most success. We go into like, like we started with these tech niche communities and now we're planning to go into like creator niche communities as we develop that. And for the API, we go into like developer niche communities. So like we, we started like a video processing community. We, we got in a bunch of newsletters. There's a lot of traction from that side. So like our main approach is like targeting very small communities and niches, which really enjoy our product. And then are we able to like um, sell our product to other people for us. Like we had a lot of people like uh, promoting the product on their own. So essentially all our growth so far has been completely organic. We've not spent any money like whatsoever on advertising or anything like that. Super impressive. That's awesome. Congrats on the progress. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Natalie, thank you again. Uh, that was exceptional. Uh, great you. energy and great presence. It was a great bunch and love what you guys are doing at Pioneer. So thank you. Thank you for coming by. Um, glad, gl glad it was interesting. Uh, we have with us today a very, very, very special guest. Um, someone who's been a cornerstone of Silicon Valley uh, significantly longer than Pioneer or, you know, many of the pioneers have been alive, let alone the organization itself, um, Vinod Kosla, uh, who, of course, is quite famous for, well, many things, um, the largest one of which I imagine is founding Sun Microsystems. Um, and he's gone on to do an infinite number of great things. If I try to spend um, this introduction trying to list all of them, we may run out of time, of which uh, his is incre incredibly precious. Um, so all that uh, being said, um, I'd like to bring up Vinod. Vinod, it's great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, um, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Hopefully this can be um, uh, a good, um, uh, a good, fun, and entertaining session for everyone. All that being said, um, we're going to get started uh, with Saj uh, from Toronto, and he's going to be presenting uh, eDropIn, which is a kind of Netflix or masterclass, but for the dental industry. Uh, so it actually has significantly more commercial application. And I'm going to let Saj take it from here. Hey, good morning, Vino. Good morning, Daniel. Um, I'm Sage, I'm the founder of eDropIn. Uh, we believe we're creating dental school in your pocket. Um, the beginning, let me just talk about the problem. Uh, dental education and medical education, very limited access. Uh, depending on your geography, you may only have access to certain schools. It can be very expensive after undergrad to go to one of these schools. I personally know because I'm a dentist and I paid about $400,000 USD in NYU for this private education. Um, and it's inflexible and very schedule and time constrained. So you have to follow this format even if it doesn't work for you. Our solution is to really create an on-demand platform that gives you access to global courses so you can choose the speakers you wanna learn from, saves you money and helps you get licensed and stay licensed. What have we done so far? In the last six months, we've been able to create 50 hours of certified dental content that you can watch today online, get points for it and use it towards your license. Um, how do we do in the last six months? We've had 145 users sign up to use this at $2.99 per year for subscription, which has led to about a $43,000 revenue. Um, plus, we've also had ad revenue from partners that we've worked with to place great content next to those videos because dentists obviously need to buy equipment to go alongside this education. So let's talk about the problem size because that's really the, the goal. I mean, each year, medical, stu medical school students graduate with about $2.6 billion in loans. So that's a very big number. And I know this personally because I've suffered through this as well. Um, our customer acquisition has been $0 ad spend, mostly through marketing through email, as well as word of mouth. We still have $25,000 in the bank, which is going to be used for creating more content. We've targeted about 2,000 dentists, but we have about a 38,000 dentist list pending still to target. And our ad revenue, like I mentioned, has been about 30,000. What are the three assumptions we are making as a company for this to be really big? Number one, people will always wanna pay less rather than more for quality education. Number two, they want more flexibility and convenience in their education, as well as access to things they couldn't access in their geography. And number three, dentists, doctors, lawyers are gonna to continue to be an important part of society. And that's what we need to make the assumptions to make sure that eDrop is very successful. Competition wise, there's a license on one axis and affordable. Licensed and not affordable would be like structured courses like Spear and Academy of General Dentistry versus, you know, our Coursera and Udemy have done a really good job in making affordability for undergrad courses. We fall in the category of licensed and affordable. 
who is the mix in the team. I'm Sage, I'm the coder, as well as the dentist and the video maker. So it kind of makes it easy for us to create these content really fast. Sanjay is the licensing guru. He's been doing this for 12 years. He's also a dentist. And Sunil manages our logistics and finances. Lastly, our next steps is to expand and grow. We're looking to hit 3,500 users as a milestone with a $1 million ARR. And on top of that, we're looking for 12 month financing to hopefully grow our content library by 10 times because we feel we have the right mix to do it really fast and expand into medicine, which we believe is a really big marketplace, just like dentistry. Our first graduating class mission would be 2025. And that's what we wanna be able to do to graduate a dental student class online and virtually, including um, including medicine maybe in the future as well. Thank you for your time. So the obvious question comes to mind, what does dental school do offer that you don't? Currently, the, the components that they offer is your um, hands-on. And so mm -hmm. what we've been trying to do is tackle some of the hands-on component as soon as we build out the online component for all the lecture courses. Um, so ideally speaking, the cost of dental school should not be that expensive. If you look at a lot of the money where it's going, it's towards provost, it's going towards faculty and a lot of redundant um, online things, which actually COVID has kind of er like erased from what you actually need. So if you look at schools now, they're, they're struggling because they're like, why are we charging that much tuition for students when really we're not spending that much in courses anymore? Mm -hmm. um, and how many hours of content do you need to to go through a full dentistry degree that a dentist would go through? For sure. So on average, you're spending about four years, but not all of that time is just content. It's also hands-on. So I would say about two years of solid content. Um, if you take it a day, um, maybe you're doing about five to six hours of classes. So on average, you probably need about a thousand hours to maybe 2000 hours of content. That is just dental school core. What we're focusing on is obviously doing even more than that. We want to let you experience dentistry that you can be actually practicing like I have after I graduated. So a lot of the stuff they don't teach you in school either. You have to take courses for that afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question that obviously comes up is if you are a dental student and go through this, assuming you go through the 1000 hours, as a student and the practical training, which you'll have to do on site, uh, what are you qualified to do or not? And how much does the brand of the license matter? In the so case the brand of a dentist? Does, that's a great question. So dental degree at the end of the day, whether you get it from NYU or whether you get it from another school, as long as it's accredited in North America, you're able to practice dentistry, which means you can do everything similarly between all schools. Our role has been to always make sure we go through qualifications on our end so that way we can provide content that's certified so that way you're not getting a, something that you're not going to be able to use. Um, so our goal is to basically make sure that you graduate with an equivalent education, if not better than what one of these schools would have given you, and it, along with the credentials to be able to practice and open a dental practice in your local community. I mean, so that, is, that be, is the goal. Yeah, so are you going to get accreditation? Or? That's a process. We've started with our, um, our business model has been focused on continuing education, which is the stuff that comes after dental school, because it's, it's easier in the door. And our goal is to basically build a reputation, which we've been doing for the last year, to make sure that every college knows about us. And so at that point, you know, it's really a process to show that you have the right faculty, you have the right resources to be able to provide a holistic education. So, you know, there's nothing stopping you from disrupting this model. It's honestly just been like, well, why haven't we done it? Because people didn't realize they could do it. And if you're a fast follower, what prevents NYU Dental School from offering continuing education? They already offer continuing education. I mean, honestly, we would be happy to have more people doing this because ultimately it brings the cost. It's like Tesla, transition to electric is not just their goal, it's a mission of the, the world. Ultimately, we're gonna need more dentists, we're gonna need more doctors, we're gonna need more lawyers. So we hope we can be a model that people want to replicate. But you know, our cutting edge would be that we'd be ahead because we'd be the first to it and we wanna make sure we're killing it. So we yeah. welcome competition I, I, in that sense. I would think about what would build a moat for you. Because for sure. if you Our do license... it successfully, mm -hmm. it'll be relatively easy for others to do, especially sure. those that are already accredited. 
Yeah, it's like Toyota copying Tesla. I mean, yes, it is possible, but we're building a stack around like, you know, how we can expedite the process of entrance and acceptance. We're expediting the process of how we deliver content, how we do hands-on in a smaller micro environment rather than putting them in one big classroom. So those are going to really be harder for NYU to replicate because they have buildings and equipment set up in one place. We're looking at more of a, how can we do this at your local practice in your community and rather than having one localized place. So for us, it's a, the model is very different and that's what builds the mode around it. Uh, great work, uh, great questions. I would like to also commend Vinod on his great work. Um, um, anyway, Thas, thank you so much. Next, I'm gonna take us to uh, John and Mihail, uh, who are from Ireland, which is a great country. And they're gonna be presenting CropSafe and CropSafe just to kind of set the mind for us here is kind of like Zapier um, or uh, you know IFTTT for farming. Uh, I'm gonna let them kind of explain the details. Guys, take it away. So myself, uh, my co-founder Michal, we grew up here in small farms in Ireland. Pretty much a place where either you're a farmer or your neighbor's a farmer. Uh, when you're farming, the way you would scout or manage your crops is you'd go out into the fields, check each individual plant for any problems, diseases, pests, write it down in your notebook, head back to the office and figure out the next plan of action. Combine this with the need to constantly monitor every factor on the farm, and you've got an awful lot of work on your hands extremely time consuming for a team of one, and even more expensive to hire in a team to help. It isn't just small farmers here in Ireland that are having similar problems. On average, it's normal to lose up to about 20% of your yield, but we don't believe this should be the case. 92% of farmers would survey their farm every single day if it was economically viable. Right now, it's not. So we built CropSafe and we figured why not let technology do this job for us? CropSafe allows farmers to create alerts and receive insights on the condition and health of their farm. All data gathered remotely from thousands of weather stations across the world, soil probes and satellites are orbiting 500 kilometers above our head. So with the CropSafe app, first you just choose an alert from the dozens we have on our marketplace, add it to your profile, choose what location you want it active on. That's pretty much it. Five seconds is all it took. CropSafe will continuously monitor in the background letting you know when you need to take action. So how it works is we ingest millions of data points from our data providers, such as NASA, the European Space Agency. We choose what data is most relevant to your alert, and we monitor it internally. Um, so then all you have to do is deal with one alert. No more messy tables or graphs or super complicated maps to look at anymore. We don't believe in those. We're still early stage, but we're moving at light speed. Over 1,500 customers on our waiting list, $80,000 in LOIs, and we're looking into raising a run later this year. Myself and Michal, we grew up together, we attended high school together, and now we plan to connect every single farm on the planet together. We're still early stage, but we're aiming high. We're raising small round right now, and we'd love to talk to any early stage investors that share our vision for digitally connecting every single farm on the planet. Thank you. So the obvious question that comes to mind is, and in, in you're right, and there's a large transition in the availability of satellite data. But I've probably seen a dozen startups all using satellite data, some adding drone data in addition to it. Um, what are you doing different? What would differentiate your offering from the other startups? Right. Uh, so the main difference we try to do is uh, we take in all these different data sources from satellites, drones, uh, sensors, and we don't let the customer deal with these sources. We believe it's kind of too complicated and too messy. The customers don't have to deal with looking at satellite maps. Um, so the difference we do is we interpret them for us, for, for those customers, and we just take those insights and tell the farmer exactly what they need to do, when they need to do it, when, where they need to do it. So maps, tables, graphs aren't really needed. Yeah, though uh, there are people doing every variant of this, depending upon the price point um, and the farmer does have uh, so the agronomists usually I don't know about Ireland in the US there's an agronomist serving every farm area uh, the question uh, the second question that comes up as we've looked at startups in this area beyond what's differentiated why couldn't others do this what's your cost of selling to farmers Either your price point is really low or your cost of selling is too high. Uh, so where do you end up and how do you handle that issue? Yeah, so we have a few different tiers depending on what type of customer it is. 
Uh, so we have tiers that uh, customers, uh, the data that we bring in doesn't actually cost us anything. It's all open source data. We also have additional tiers on top of that where you do take in paid data, so the likes of Planet data or Airbus data. Um, and that's just scales on the size of the customer. Um, so yeah, we have a kind of a tiered approach to that. And how do you price it? I'm more really asking question around what's your cost of s selling to a farmer? Yes, so we charge uh, per acre per month. And how much is that per acre per month? Uh, it varies with customers. We're, we're really just kind of in the early stages of cha uh, char um, changing around mm -hmm. prices. So it's around, it's around $2 or so per month per acre. Okay. So the big question you will have is if I run a thousand acre farm or a 5,000 acre farm, which would be a reasonable size farm in the US, I think, uh, how can you afford to sell to farmers individually? Uh, they're, you know, they're starting to pay you uh, serious money. Um, what's your cost of selling? Yeah, so that's something we're definitely experimenting with um, at the early stages right now. Um, but one thing we have been looking into as well is selling directly to agronomists and distributors directly. So they'll have a pool of farmers um, and, and they're more likely to, to invest in it because then they can manage um, a bunch of farmers more, more easily. But, but yeah, something we're still experimenting with. So, uh, and that's an interesting question. If you sell through agronomists, then you have the reverse problem. They want to get lots more data, like some of the other satellite apps do, and look like they're experts to their customers, which is the farmer. So a lot of sales go through the agronomist, but those agronomists want to impress the farmer with something the farmer can't do themselves. So you have this catch 22. If you simplify it a lot, the farmer can buy it, and the, but the agronomist doesn't have a way to impress the farmer or add his expertise to it and his markup, of course, which is the only reason they'd sell it. Um, we, we only have a short time. My other recommendation to you would be look at what you can do different. You know, everybody's using the same data, for example, hyperspectral or even multispectral imaging some of the best plants I've seen use that to be highly predictive of even the growth stage of a plant or the lack of nitrogen or some other things. So a lot more information in hyperspectral. Now it's a lot more expensive to develop the technology, but you'll have a differentiation issue and a go-to-market, what's the cost of a sale? Perfect. Really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you again. Um, great work, everyone. Um, uh, Vinod, uh, last, certainly not least, we have uh, a, a, an interesting um, piece of software for you. We're really pulling you here in all directions from, uh, you know, the healthcare world to farming. Uh, and then finally, we're going to end in dating. So we're going to bring up Sasha from LA, and he'll be presenting Lolly, uh, which is a kind of a, a TikTok for dating uh, that's been doing quite well lately. So, yep, as Daniel said, uh, I'm Sasha. I'm the co-founder and president of Lolly. And at Lolly, we're basically defining a new category we call social dating. Um, so, yeah, excited to tell you more about it. Uh, as you can see from the left, Lolly is not your typical dating app. Okay, we've abandoned the left-right swipe paradigm, um, you know, made famous by Tinder at all. Uh, and, and instead introduced like an infinite feed of short form video content. Um, and, and so, yeah, we depend very heavily on that nexus between social and dating. Um, and, and really our three main value props are like video content, community, um, and expression. Um, and so, you know, none of the leading incumbents in the dating space have tapped into these three pillars, um, nor are they positioned well to do so. Uh, and, and, you know, Bumble, for instance, which is filing to go public, uh, you know, you still can't upload a video to your profile, um, which feels insane. And so, uh, anyway, that's, that's like where Lolly fits into the picture, um, and pun intended, uh, in terms of the industry, just over the past year, uh, you know, we've passed this inflection point where users, um, specifically Gen Z, uh, have felt disillusioned with just a lot of the dating apps out there. And so instead they're turning to TikTok um, to actually find dates. And, and, you know, realistically this should come as no surprise, right? Cause like TikTok's a fun, engaging experience and uh, it's the best way to get to know one another um, through personality. Um, and, and, you know, at Lolly, just quickly, I mean, we are leveraging the fact that TikTok democratizes these behaviors 
and just like bringing it more into dating. Uh, in terms of the app itself, we've been out um, on the app store for just over a month. Our users are averaging, um, you know, just north of eight minutes per day. Um, and our D28 retention is 33%. Um, so nothing to be complacent about, but definitely a strong signal that people love what we're building. Um, quick bit of background on myself. I uh, came from eight years in neuroscience. Um, so, you know, one fellowships from the NSF, the NIH. Uh, was a co-author on two major publications, one of which we actually discovered a new protein in Alzheimer's. Um, but, you know, it takes a village. And so, you know, lucky enough to have an incredible team full time, um, you know, former, uh, you know, people who've worked at Tesla, Facebook, uh, Apple and beyond um, to John Pleasance, the former president of IAC, um, who's our active director to investors, advisors like Blair Shane, former CMO of Sequoia, um, you know, Ron Conway's SV Angel, uh, John Scully and beyond. Um, so, yeah, with that, I give you Lolly and, uh, you know, thanks for listening. Other than this need for self-expression as a part of your dating profile or non-profile, if, if I gather what you're doing right, what need are you really meeting that isn't filled? Dating, as you know, is a crowded marketplace. Yeah. What um, need so aren't you, uh, are you filling that isn't met today? Well, the fact that, you know, the baseline for just the user experience on a dating app has just shifted fundamentally, right? Like people set kind of normalized to, um, you know, at this point, Gen Z specifically has normalized to TikTok and the kind of fun, engaging experience. Um, you know, TikTok has rendered Instagram boring and stale to Gen Z. Um, and, and so, you know, hence their rollout of reels and beyond. And so by the same token, like as an industry, dating has shifted from, you know, being pure utility based to actually, um, you know, being, uh, there's a demand for entertainment and fun. There's been no fun in, in dating for years, right? Um, and, and so for us, it's really introducing that fun and fulfilling that need um, because again, the standard has been set. The app for, for, for eyeballs to be on your app, it needs to be fun, it needs to be engaging. And so, yeah, yeah. that's again, where Lolly comes so, in. So again, the question I would ask is I get yeah. the fun angle mm -hmm. and a new, more expressive medium to explain mm -hmm. yourself but you still want to meet a need that isn't being met. Uh, in the end, if somebody is looking for a date, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is it they can't get? And of course, the related question is, how do you uh, uh, really monetize all this? Mm -hmm. What sort of your monetization strategy and does that, how does that switch the balance between the casual entertainment person who would do other things on TikTok sure. versus people looking for a date and willing to pay for it or monetization? Yeah. Okay. So, so to unpackage like the first part of your question, um, I'd say that, uh, you know, for us, um, like if you look at Tinder, for instance, right, like, or any of these Bumble hands are all the same, um, you're judging users, um, like other kind of potential um, dates really along a single axis, right? Like through three pictures in one sentence, you have to sell your story. And so invariably, like, you know, the kind of most physically attractive people are gonna win on that ecosystem. So like the need that we're fulfilling is basically the person who would otherwise be overlooked on a lot of these other apps um, actually have a chance to sell their story, to showcase their personality, to basically be much more multifaceted than just, you know, physically attractive. Um, so, you know, of course it's still gonna be a component and that will transfer well to Lolly. Um, but what we're seeing is that, you know, the people who, again, would otherwise kind of fall through the cracks on like a dating app who, who aren't 6'4", who aren't, you know, kind of classically perfect looking, um, actually can showcase the other sides, their talents, their humor, um, beyond. Uh, in terms of the second part, just with monetization. So, so uh, let's, sorry, uh, yeah. let's just dig in a little bit more. I think Please, yeah. a much clearer statement of what you're trying to do is people who don't show up well in a picture but might in a more expressive medium show more dimensions of their personality because they don't look perfect. That's a very clear statement exactly. of what you're yes. trying to do as opposed to it's more fun. Fun is a medium to show that, hey, I may not be great looking by usual metrics, but I'm very interesting or fun. Exactly, I think that's a perfect distillation, honestly. Um, in, Though in, I would uh, ask you how would you, how you'd make tau binding proteins fun. <laughs> um, well, we can dig into that another time, but because I would love to tell you about it. But um, 
I, I want to quickly address the monetization stuff because um, yes, basically, uh, yeah, I mean, again, there's a million just like privileges that were kind of afforded by being at that nexus again between social and dating, one of which being the fact that we can monetize using like the classic, like, you know, kind of freemium subscription model that you see on dating apps and also the in-app um, ads and sponsorships that you'll see on, um, you know, like a TikTok, for instance. You know, one of the things that we're really excited about, though, do- down the line um, is basically having like a B2B situation where, um, you know, companies can come in and actually get marketing insights into the audiences. Um, we have very high dimensional data on user engagement, on user responses, coupling basically insights by saying, hey, you know, in response to this prompt that said, um, you know, what's your favorite beverage on a Saturday night? You know, Grey Goose, um, you did very well in like, you know, Indiana with this. We have like, you know, a ton of metadata on every single user. And so, again, just coupling those insights with that metadata. Um, we're, yeah, we're I would about. ask the question since we don't have much time. Sure. On the monetization side, instead of trying to monetize directly, mm-hmm. are there needs that haven't been met? So, for example, a long time ago, we had a dating app called the How About We, which tried to bring interesting experiences for your day. And I fundamentally thought that was wrong because you were trying to monetize a commercial product. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're selling something to somebody they don't need, it's generally not a good idea. You don't have an aligned business model with the user. But if you strictly curated them, uh, mm-hmm. the, the dates, they could go on and charge them a percentage of that. Mm-hmm. That'd be a very different aligned model. And you get paid for curation, not for advertising. One's a push model, the other's a pull model. And you might look at it fairly carefully to say, what need can you meet that also makes you money? I love that. Thank you. That was really helpful. Vinod, thank you so much. Um, uh, feedback has been great. Hopefully this was kind of fun and invigorating for you. Um, uh, if, if you have any feedback actually, you know, for us more broadly, uh, we'll, we'll send you um, uh, s- some of the presentations that happened later today if you're, if you're kind of interested in them uh, as well. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I hope we get a chance to hang out in the real world soon. Yeah. It's great, uh, always great to talk to entrepreneurs. I love doing that, but yes, I hope we all come back to the real world soon. Thanks. Super duper. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Vinod. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's time for um, our final component of the day. Um, we are going to have a- Um, we're pretty excited uh, to show you uh, shortly an interview uh, with Emmett. We actually recorded it at an earlier date and we were going to uh, stream it right now. Um, as it turns out, there are a couple of things in those slides uh, that, that Emmett shared where he was kind of walking us through the early presentation of Twitch uh, that may not be completely appropriate for kind of the, the broader uh, audience of the internet, just given the visibility of Twitch. So um, we're going to make a bunch of quick edits uh, to that video and then rebroadcast it. Uh, as soon as possible, probably at a later date, maybe uh, tomorrow or at some point next week. So uh, apologies for that. Um, I promise it actually happened. uh, And um, we'll be sure to uh, send you a link uh, when we're ready to rebroadcast it. So uh, all that being said, let's move on to the next segment.